me to choose a speaker for the last lecture of the year. So the problem is, who do you ask? Um, what topic or issues do you highlight? For me this year, there was no question. During lockdown, a friend and colleague, Sid Howes, recommended a book which he thought I might be interested in reading. The book, The, British, uh, the Brutish Museums by Professor Dan Hicks, I found to be both fascinating and disturbing as it raised serious questions about the origin of certain collections in certain British museums. So I'm grateful to Dan that he has agreed to be our speaker tonight. Dan is a British archeologist and anthropologist, born in Durham, educated in Birmingham. Dan was awarded his BA degree at St. John's College, Oxford, and his doctorate in archeology span and anthropology from Bristol University. During the 90s, Dan worked as a field archaeologist in the local authority and private sector and conducted field work in the UK and across the Eastern Caribbean and Eastern United States. Widely published and a regular on television and radio, Dan is now Professor of Contemporary Archaeology at Oxford University and curator at the Pitts Rivers Museum. His research focuses on contemporary archaeology, material cultural studies, historical archaeology and museum studies. And his lecture tonight focuses on the restitution of museum objects. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Dan Hicks. And can we please mute for anybody who hasn't, please. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. So uh, while everyone's finding the, uh, the mute button, uh, which is always an important thing, um, to find so that you know if I so I guess I'm going to be speaking for half an hour or so and then we'll open it up for questions to be done yes. in about an hour does that sound about right or yes I can I, I can talk for as long or as short as you <laughs> want obviously uh but uh but thank you okay so I'll aim for I'll, I'll aim to talk for about half half or a little more than the hour and then we'll open it up for questions and so uh, thank you so much for that incredibly uh, kind uh you know introduction but also for the invitation um so uh, this is a book that has uh, uh, led me to talk to a whole host of audiences around the world over lockdown obviously a uh, zoom has uh, become a part of our lives in a way that it never was uh, and so I've uh, found myself having uh, conversations about the Benin Bronzes with uh, colleagues in uh, Los Angeles, in New York, in Berlin, in Australia. But actually, for me, one of the most important aspects of this is how in the UK, how in England, Wales, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, we start to look at the fact that we've got these objects hidden away in the collections. And so Cardiff and uh, South Wales is absolutely no different um, from the situation in Exeter, in Ipswich, in uh, Belfast, in Oxford, Cambridge, and of course, London. So it's incredibly nice to be here. And I really uh, value this audience uh, as such an important sort of a part of this conversation, which is increasingly, as I guess my lecture will say, it's, a, it's an increasingly uh, uh, sort of a national conversation. So I'm just gonna share my screen and hopefully you can see that if someone could not, yeah, I think I'm saying nod. So, so that's fantastic that that's worked. So that's great. So I, I mean, I guess in some ways I'm gonna be uh, talking about this book uh, the, uh, the the uh, the paperback edition of which was out uh, last month, um, and so the hardback was out about a year ago. It's a book that has uh, dominated my life and transformed my life in some ways over the past year. Um, so I will be talking about that, and I put a link in the chat. But I also in the chat I put a link to the thing I'm going to finish on, which is a really boring but really important, I think sort of writing and sort of a report, which is a report into the 145 objects that we hold at the University of Oxford, insofar as we understand at the, at the present moment from the, you know, from the research that we've undertaken from the 1897 attack of the Benin attack upon uh, what is now uh, Nigeria. So, so that's where we'll end, but for now, let's just have a, have a, have a look for those of you 
who can't uh, visualize the pit rivers or those of you who have visited but obviously it's been hard to visit or to repeat a visit in sort of recent years in the past sort of two years or so because of uh, the lockdown here is oxford university's uh, yeah, pit rivers museum in all its sort of victorian splendor it it is an institution founded in 1884. You know, it's a named museum. It's a museum where I've worked for almost uh, 15 years now as the curator of uh, world archaeology. Uh, and as we heard, I'm also, also a professor in the School of Archaeology. I have, have this incredibly sort of lucky life in some ways and the privileged life to be half in archaeology here, a teaching and sort of researching half in the museum, which is a department of the university, sort of working on these objects. And so on a good day, it is an absolute sort of a dream of the two worlds. On a bad day, these are uh, two jobs that are completely incompatible with each other, the world of teaching and research and the world of uh, the museums. But certainly what is absolutely the case for institutions uh, like the Pitt Rivers is that the role of the curator starts with some sort of affinity with the work of the conservator. So, and so a big part of my job is to keep things, you know, largely the same, to make sure that the ironwork isn't uh, rusting away, that the moths aren't eating the uh, textiles of the... 300,000 objects which we hold from every country in the world that have, 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 have built up over the over the past sort of, sort of a century and a half of the the existence of the museum and of course which also include objects that were incorporated into the uh, the, the museum that were already in Oxford when it was uh, founded in 1884 the uh, the great collections from the uh, the Cook voyages, from the Tradescants, and and so on in the seventeenth century, and so on. But I guess the book starts with the concern that some in my position have mistaken their role to keep things the same, as there's been a sort of a mission creep through which we've started thinking that our role is to stop the world from changing around us and as we'll hear in the lecture the world really has uh, uh, altered around us in the course of the past uh, 10 years or so so the big question really is how do we keep in step with our times while also continuing to perform this absolutely central role of how to care for for these objects, which we inherit, if you like, from the 19th century, from, you know, from the Victorian age. So it's a constant reinvention, a constant uh, role of, of sort of conservation that this in some ways holds in, uh, in common some of the uh, challenges for an institution uh, yeah, yeah, like your own, you know, how do we continue to actually uh, maintain the best of the Victorian institutions of science and knowledge and art and culture while being ready to acknowledge that we need to move with the times and to keep in, uh, if you like, sort of relevant for our times. So the Pitt Rivers Museum was uh, founded, it was a named museum, it was founded by Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, who was a soldier he was an archaeologist, an anthropologist, a curator. He was the first inspector of ancient monuments. He inherited a great fortune, actually fairly late in his life, in his uh, 50s, where he adopted the name of Pitt Rivers, which was an, an inheritance of a vast fortune that started as, as the Rigby fortune from the West Indies and was added to in various ways. So he was an immensely rich man, but also a man who was a theorist and his sort of theories of objects have been incredibly influential for the disciplines of archaeology and anthropology. And they are very much 
sort of of their time in certain ways. And here is the diagram which Augustus Pitt Rivers um, created in 1874 in order to illustrate his ideas about, about objects and, and, and about how he wanted to see objects in his mu in his in it in his collections uh, uh, displayed. So it's a diagram made in, in, in 1874, which was the year of the first uh, moment at which his objects that he'd been collecting for so long went on a public display. So at first they, they were in East London in the Bethnal Green Museum from 1874 to 1878. They were then displayed in in uh, Kensington, in South Kensington, what's now the VNA, in between 1878 and 1882, and then they were donated to the, to the University of Oxford in, in 1884. But this wasn't any normal museum that displayed objects according to periods of time or culture or location in the world. He organised his um, you know, museum according to type. So the typological museum, as he described it, was all about a sort of theory of objects that sought to expand the notion of the evolution of the natural world, that sense of the Darwinian idea that the world is filled with uh, survivals from different moments in evolutionary history, which we can read in order to understand in the natural world the notion of of you know the survival of of the fittest he said well well what if that same evolutionary framework was also something we could apply to the much messier world of culture what if art and culture and especially weapons he was very interested in weapons he was a soldier. He was undertaking research in the Royal Armouries in London, in the uh, the Museum of 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 the United Services Institution, which is now Rusey, the uh, you know, which which uh, you know, which is a military think tank. Uh, uh, yeah, today we wouldn't think of them actually having a museum, but they did have one in the eighteen sixties. He was working with these these sort of weapons and. You know, these are really the, these these the objects that have been taken um, from those whom the uh, the British Army and Navy had fought in the previous uh, sort of centuries. Uh, these, in terms of the objects we're seeing now in front of us, were objects that he purchased in London from dealers and uh, and at auction rooms. He wasn't the sort of anthropologist that collected through sort of traveling the world, although he certainly did travel, but he was largely collecting objects that arrived in, in London. And here we have a diagram which we could describe as the evolution of the wooden stick. So in the middle is a hypothetical wooden stick, and then moving out to the edges uh, are the shields, the lances, the boomerangs, and other weapons each of which represents a real object that's here in the Pitt Rivers, a hundred yards away from me where I'm sitting now in Oxford. We could uh, get these objects out and show them to you. Each, each one is an individual object, all from a single sort of culture. They're all from Aboriginal Australia. And he organized them without any sense of understanding the relative age of each one of them. He, he, he had no evidence of how old was it? 30 years old, 100 years old, each of the boomerangs or the lances or the shields. Nevertheless, he organized them according to what he called hypothetical series, whereby one could say that the form of these weapons evolved. You can order them from the simple to the complex. So we might reflect upon this sort of theory of material culture which Augustus uh, Pitt Rivers introduced by saying that in some ways it's a very conventional Victorian improvement narrative, uh, an idea that things are getting better, you know, they're an optimistic bunch, the Victorians, but I guess there are two things that need to, uh, to you know, that we need to highlight. One is that this was a theory of 
objects, of the material world, of, sort of material culture that was so important as a foundational theory for archaeology and anthropology that was really based in weapons. There was a sense that, you know, because of course, uh, because of his, his experience, in the, of course, in the Crimean War, where in the 1850s, a very small difference in weaponry between the musket and the rifle had been absolutely decisive in the victory of the French and the British over the Russians. So the question of empires falling or, or succeeding, he saw as really you know, grounded in these very small, sort of relatively small differences. That one, you know, that one can see in objects. So it's a theory of objects that's uh, grounded in, in uh, violence, in the military world, but it's also a theory of cultural supremacy, which is saying that, okay, he adopted the Darwinian idea that human difference is not based upon biological difference, we're all a single species, but nevertheless, we can talk about Victorian difference or supremacy that's based on an idea that our objects are better than others. The weaponry is superior, let's say, to the weaponry used by, uh, uh, at the time, you know, soldiers in Africa. So that notion that we're all the same, but we've got different objects, we've got hi different histories of uh, technology, was certainly part of a theory that was really bound up with what, in my book, I talk about as something we might understand as World War Zero, the increasing massive high scale industrial scale of war that was enacted upon Africa by Europeans from 1884, from the Berlin uh, Congress when the Europeans famously uh, divided up Africa in between themselves, led to what we euphemistically call the, the scramble for Africa, that's a notion that makes us think that this is kind of uh, Europeans elbowing each other out of the way in order to undertake a land grab. It's a term that makes us <laughs> that sort of distracts from how many Africans actually lost their lives, how many hundreds of thousands or um, and millions of people were killed in that 30 year period. And of course, in the years running up to that. So that, that sense of what the Pitt Rivers is, its relationship to militarism, it's founded by a soldier archaeologist, all that was brought home actually really vividly and shockingly for me as a curator here when the protest movement Roads Must Fall Oxford in 2015 sends a social media message that said that the Pitt Rivers Museum is one of the most violent spaces in Oxford. So at that time, this was a complete shock to us. We'd never thought of that. If I think back to 2015, we thought, you know, that we were doing a pretty good job in the Pit Rivers. We had undertaken some restitutions of ancestral human remains you know, you know, to indigenous communities, First Nations in Canada, Native American groups, and also to the Pacific. We'd hosted what we call source communities, who, whose, whose objects these were, historically to come and work with them and so on. Suddenly this African-led movement, because Africa had never really been a focus of our work, although we have, have immense, we have uh, tens of thousands of, of, of African objects here at the Pit Rivers. Suddenly an African-led movement said that the Pit Rivers is a violent space. And that was a real challenge for me. So when people are protesting outside your museum, you have to start to work out what they're thinking what is going on and to understand that. So that's really the book in some ways sort of tells the story of trying to understand what the Roads Must Fall movement was talking about when they said that the Pit Rivers, you know, the, the location at which, you know, a museum in, in which I remain immensely uh, uh, proud to work. How can it be violent? How can, how can we be causing harm in the present and what can we do about it? So it helps, I think, to understand what the Rosemus Full movement was in a, in a South African context, you know, as it emerged in early 2015. So this is about the fact that, of course, apartheid in South Africa ended in 1994. And here we are in, tw in early 2015, where 18 year olds and 19 year olds in South Africa, in Cape Town, who had been born after the end of apartheid, 
they were continuing to experience institutional racism, direct racism in their everyday lives on campus. And at the heart of the university, which famously had been, uh, you know, it, it was it's on land that had been uh, donated by Cecil John Rhodes, the you know, the imperialist, the founder of the of the of the South Africa Company, with, you know, the diamond miner, the mass murderer, the ideological inventor of what would go on to become apartheid, which was based on the racial segregation which he introduced, both in what he called Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, of course, uh, and also South Africa. At the heart of the campus was this image of Cecil Rhodes, uh, an artwork, a sculpture. So what the movement said was that this image of Cecil Rhodes was not simply a side effect of this history. It was a central technology that had been erected circa 1910 in order to seek not only to memorialize this man, but also to make his worldview last. So removing the image of Cecil Rhodes became a central part of seeking to remove the white supremacist infrastructure, the cultural supremacist infrastructure, the idea of so the cultural supremacy that Rhodes sought to um, enact and those that came after him sought to, to embed into art and culture at the heart of the university, that had to be removed. So that was what the Rosemans Fall movement was about. It was an anti-racist movement. It, it was an ongoing anti-apartheid movement that said that, that the anti-apartheid movement is in the present is not over. So in the autumn of 2015, those students, a lot of the students involved in those protests, who were funded by the Rhodes uh, Trust to come to Oxford, suddenly arrived in a city that also has an image of uh, Cecil Rhodes outside Oriel College. So the fascinating process that then happened was these students and <laughs> researchers started to point out to those of us that been, have been here a long time, that across the city of Oxford, there were ways in which aspects of colonial thinking, aspects of imperial history had, had been commemorated and celebrated and made to endure in exactly the same way as has, ha has, ha has happened with the Rhodes image at Cape Town. So that wasn't only Cecil Rhodes outside Oriel College, the protesters marched to All Souls College to protest the naming of the Codrington Library after the 18th century slave trader uh, Codrington. Uh, actually, that library has since been unnamed. It's now just called the All Souls Library. It's, you know, they pointed out the carvings of the monkeys outside the old Indian Institute. They obviously pointed to Rhodes House, but they also pointed to, here at the Pitt Rivers, the Benin case. At the heart of this argument about the persistence of the colonial worldview into the present was not the displays of weapons, such as we as we saw in the earlier diagram, but was the court, uh, court art of the Benin case and the history of that. So I was forced really, I mean, when people are protesting outside your museum, you need to try and understand what they're talking about. So I was forced really to try to make sense of sort of what, what's going on and what that case was. So the Benin, so in the time available sort of to me, I mean, just just in the in the final uh, 10 minutes or so I've got available, uh, you know, I really want to uh, explain what the punitive expedition was, what the objects are and how they come, you know, what they come to represent in the present. So the punitive expedition of 1897 was one, as I found out in writing the book, of, of so many other you know, expeditions that, that were that were not enacted sort of by the British upon their colonies, but were, a, were actually really a product of the corporate colonialism that was represented not only by the South Africa Company of Cecil Rhodes, but, but also by the Royal Niger Company, such as we had in what's now Nigeria, but also the notion not of the colony, but of the protectorate. This is a kind of imperial formation where you protect a country in the way that the mafia protects you, right? You're being protected, but you're not really being protected. So it's these edge, these marginal spaces of empire and the return of the corporate model 
for colonialism in the Royal Niger Company, the South Africa Company, that reinvented a model that we'd seen seen earlier in history, you know, with the East India Company, of course, in across Asia, or with the Royal Africa Company in the 17th century that had founded the transatlantic slave trade. Here in the 1890s, we had a return of that corporate model. You know, after 1884, after the Berlin Congress, that model used not only a whole series of uh, military attacks in order to remove kings and chiefs who were in the way of the interests, of the corporate interests that were seeking to develop sort of rubber plantations or indeed were interested in sort of palm oil. So this largely is a history of kind of margarine. It's a history of the rubber tyres that went on the bikes of Oxford uh, Doms as they cycled around sort of 1890s Oxford. Um, so this was what was in the way of those those expansions, uh, that extractivist form of empire was you know, a series of, of sort of kings and chiefs who simply the military powers of the 1890s actively removed. Hand in hand with the military attacks, though, went the looting of artwork. So actually looting artworks, you know, in this very tight time frame between the 1880s and let's say the 1910s, um, looting of artworks turned into a military strategy. The taking of artworks, the destruction of sort of palaces, the, 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 yeah, the desecration of religious sites. Here in uh, Benin City, one of the great medieval West African sort of, you know, urban civilizations with a whole landscape of historic uh, palaces, each of which had been inhabited by a king, by an ober, in a sort of long line of obers that reached back unbroken earlier than Elizabeth I. These royal courts, each of the palaces was abandoned and then sort of became the focus for religious activity that was focused on the veneration of the ancestors, on the ongoing royal religious you know, tradition. Hand in hand with that, a unique artistic tradition had uh, developed. And the Benin bronzes had been so sacred, they were kept almost unknown outside of Benin City, you know, up until this attack of 1897. So in that attack, more than 10,000 objects were taken, most famously the brass plaques that told in this very uh, unique iconography, the history of the achievements of each Ober, their interactions with the Portuguese. So more than 1,200 of those here on the left hand side are the displays of the British Museum that, that holds about 200 of those 1,200 or so. But as you'll see on the right hand side, what we learn from the displays of the Pitt Rivers is a whole host of other forms of artworks were also taken. That includes maybe four or five thousand, you know, other items made in bronze. This include the Ober's heads, such as, as we see in the middle, into the heads of which, in a hole in the top of the heads, these carved ivory tusks, such as we see at the bottom. You can see a detail on the right hand side there again, with a very unique iconography. These are, if you like, historical documents. These are objects that kind of tell the history of each of the kings from the 14th or 15th centuries up until the 19th century. Here, here at the top left and right, we've got the bronze sculptures in the form of the hornblower or the leopard. At the bottom left hand side, you've got the ivory hip ornament mask that represents the Queen Mother Idia, which again, these absolute, absolutely unique artworks which were taken you know, in this attack. Here's a very rare photograph from 1891 of one of the altars on which the bells and the heads and the ivories were laid out, reminding us that the taking of these objects and the slaughter of the tens of thousands of people that were involved in the taking of uh, Benin City, this, you know, the 50 kilometer diameter area into which the British came with these, you know, with these ultra modern weapons, with Maxim machine guns, with rocket launchers, with uh, field guns, with electric lighting, with barbed wire. These are the technologies of warfare that found their way with such horror to the soils of Europe in the 20th century, but these were being uh, tested upon, upon African bodies, upon, uh, upon African societies 
here in the 1880s, 1890s. And so when the Hague Convention of 1899, the first Hague Convention was introduced, um, so many of the things that it outlawed, you know, the filing down of, of the bullets in order, in, order to, in order to create what we call the dum-dum bullets that enhanced as much as possible the physical uh, damage upon the human body, the, you know, the burning of uh, villages and towns of innocent civilians, the desecration of uh, religious sites, the looting of artwork, all of those things were outlawed in 1899, really, as my book argues, in a direct response to what the British had uh, just done in what is now Nigeria. So they took photographs as well as taking objects. Here on the right-hand side is a famous image of the, of the looters in mid-looting, as it were, with the plaques laid out among the remains of the burnt out uh, palace. Here on the left-hand side, though, a lesser known photograph that's also from the Pitt Rivers collection that shows the sheer scale of you know, the burning of the city. So restitution has been a long-standing process. The desire for after the reinstatement of the Royal Court and the Ober un under the British administration in the, in, in the early 20th century, the return of these sacred royal objects has been incredibly important for traditional religion, for traditional sovereignty, but also more generally for Nigerian culture. So the first objects actually were returned as early as 1938 in a return that was overseen by, yeah, by the British Museum. Here is Obra Kenzawa II receiving two coral work crowns and also a coral work robe, uh, as I say, in 1938. So around the 100 year anniversary in 1997, there was a great deal of activity, famously uh, Bernie Grant MP outside the, uh, what was then the Museum of uh, Mankind shouting through a megaphone saying that these objects should be returned. That movement, that 100 year movement was largely considered to be a failure. But as we approach the 125th anniversary next year, I think anyone who uh, has looked at the, you know, the news, has opened the newspaper recently, will be aware of um, how much that movement is finally seeing returns sort of happening. So I don't have time to tell you about all the made up words and the invented concepts that are in the book. You can, you can go and read some of the theoretical sides of that if you want. But I think I would just say, just in conclusion, really, as I, as I move towards a conclusion, that a part of what the book argues is that our museums represent really crucial locations to think about how in the UK we come to terms what in the United States has been part of a recognition of the importance in the civil rights movement of a new phase of anti-racism, a new phase of recogni you know, recognizing uh, the ongoing nature, exactly as we see in South Africa, that's that's going on in in America and also in Europe, the way in which forms of racial violence from the 19th century for the Confederacy uh, actually uh, continue into the present. So my colleague Nick, uh, Nick Mezoff in his book, The Appearance of, of, uh, uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement, which he wrote not in the most recent phase of this civil rights movement, but actually after the racist murders of Eric Garner and Michael Brown in 2014, he made in that book the really crucial, it's a very simple, but a very sort of crucial observation, which was that it was a shift in our regimes of visuality, as he calls it, how we see things in the world that led to a new kind of politics, because it was dash cam footage and cell phone footage that suddenly in America made visible anti-black violence and murder that had been happening for centuries. Suddenly those acts could be seen and shared. And that led to what we see now as the Black Lives Matter movement. I'd add to that the comments made in the wake of the racist murder of George Floyd by the Minnesota Attorney General, who said that I wouldn't call today's verdict uh, justice because justice implies true restoration. But what it is, is accountability, which is a first step towards justice. So what the British Museums argues is that insofar as our museums were not only receiving objects that were saved from the battlefield in which 
so much violence and so much loss and death happened. But actually, the display of these objects in our museums was itself like the erecting of a statue to white supremacy or to cultural supremacy. It was a statement built to last to say that we beat Nigeria, we beat the Oba, we defeated the Oba, we remember this by taking this art. By Within weeks, these items were on display in Berlin, in London, in Oxford. You know, the British Museum, they were displayed in the Assyrian Saloon. They were on display alongside the, 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 the works of the Bronze Age of the Mediterranean and the works of, of ancient Egypt. So, so the message was very clear. We have blown you back into the Bronze Age. Your culture is dead. And the museum was put to work for something which it wasn't built for. It was put to work to tell a story of cultural supremacy. At their best, we've never needed something like World Culture Museums to celebrate the many different ways of seeing and making and thinking that we experience around the world. But, but, but that doesn't mean that our museums should any longer, in my view, you know, be spaces where we display artwork that was taken with such violence, that was displayed in order to tell a celebratory story of supremacy and where there are communities and nations asking for those returns in the present. So what some are calling the decolonization of museums, what I prefer to see as the ordinary everyday work of the museum curator, because remember, restitution is already a normal part of our work when it comes to Holocaust spoliation, a very different historical circumstance, but still about returning stolen art to the survivors or to the descendants, or indeed the return of ancestral human remains to indigenous or First Nations communities. We do that. We've been doing that for 30 years. It's a very normal part of our work. When it comes to returning African goods, African stolen goods on a on a case by case basis, when asked, not sending back, but sort of give it being open to the potential that we, that we might sort of give back when asked, that work of the curator starts with the very boring work of just making lists, saying what we've got. So the book fundamentally at the heart of the book, you know, is an appendix that is a list of the 160 plus institutions around the world that hold these items. So that the fact that this is now a conversation that's happening around the world, because the Benin bronzes, the violence of that attack upon the Benin, the, the court of Benin, shattered these items to such a degree that they are around the world. And now conversations about return are happening from Los Angeles to St. Petersburg, from Paris to Berlin, from Cardiff to Aberdeen. So those of you that will have, will have read about Aberdeen, Cambridge and other places returning things. For me, a great watershed here was the Times uh, editorial from March 2021, earlier this year. So the Times newspaper changed its editorial line in support of the return of the Benin Bronzes. For me, that was an incredibly important watershed. So I'm just going to finish with this, the, these images of the report which I've also, you can uh, download it if you're, if you're thus inclined. Uh, it, it's in the chat of this call. It's the report that does, the, which I just published a fortnight ago, that does the very slow and very boring, but very important work of working through the provenance histories. What do we hold from the Benin 1897 attack here at the Pitt Rivers? 145 objects of the more than 10,000. It's a tiny number. It's, it, it's one and a half percent of the total but each of those objects is incredibly important each of it each of those has a history we have to reconstruct the histories of taking the histories of the soldiers the sailors the administrators the chaotic way in which more than 200 of these people simply took what they could for their own enrichment some of those objects were sold on on the open market within weeks some were passed down from father to son, you know, across the, uh, the generations and found their way onto the market or into museums years on. Simply cataloguing these items is work that hasn't been done because the shocking thing for many people is 
that actually we don't know what we've got in museums. Most museums have an incredibly poor understanding of what's in the storerooms. This is not a story about what's on display. It's about how many objects we hold hidden away in the storerooms, often in, in what we call orphaned collections, collections where there is no world culture collector, uh, curator, there is no African specialist, but these significant uh, uh, collections, you know, whether in Cardiff or whether in Belfast or whether in Birmingham or whether in London, you know, these, these are so important for cultures in Nigeria that we, for whom they have, have such a significance. And for us, for too long, we've been simply neglecting these uh, royal and sacred objects. So sharing that information of the objects, but also, as you'll see in a moment, sharing some also of the photographs and the archival sources that we hold as well. So, so it's a moment now for transparency from our museums. It's a role, I think the role of uh, people like me who work in the museums is we just have to make this this information available sort of freely we need to share we need to do the research we need to allow the public conversation about how we come to a reckoning with this phase of our military history that we don't really talk about we can tell histories of every almost minute by minute hour by hour of the, of, of the second world war the first world war but these incredible, this massive range of attacks upon Africa, Magdala, 1868 in Ethiopia, the Battle of Omdurman in Sudan in 1898, the attacks upon Asante in Ghana, the attacks across the continent, they were a big deal. They ended up with objects in museums, even to the point of watercolours, such as we see in front of us now, that were made by the chief of staff, Egerton, of the altars before the looting was undertaken. So I'm going to finish there and hopefully that's a useful update in terms of what the book's about but also in terms of how we and the museums in a world where so much of the newspaper reporting of this is that there's a culture war, that there are woke researchers talking about histories that we shouldn't be talking about. Actually at their best our world culture museums are unique spaces where we as you know in here in the uk we can learn about our own military history we can share knowledge of objects that are so important to some african colleagues and also though we can be open to return on a case-by-case -case basis and so thank you very much for listening thank you dan thank you very much um has anybody got any questions for dan just just sort of say if you if you have a question Oh dear. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hello. Sorry, go ahead. Can you go ahead? Who's speaking? Gail? No? I'd like to ask you, Dan, while I'm waiting. Oh, sorry, Robert. Uh, fantastic talk, Professor Hicks. Uh, is there a judgment on returning, how safe it is to return objects to the countries of origin? Yes, absolutely. It's a really, really important question, which we, we hear all the time. You know, how, how is it the right thing to do? Is, is there, uh, you know, are, are, are objects unsafe if they're returned? Um, so I think, I think there, are, there are various points of principle that we can start with. Um, I'm old enough to remember in the 1990s that so many of the arguments we heard against restitution in the case in the very different cases of nazi loot or of human ancestral human remains were made and were defeated the idea that we might lose uh, scientific knowledge in ancestral human remains well of course in those <laughs> cases actually these are human remains so of course if they're returned they are destroyed uh for many african communities the ancestral nature of some of these objects mean that the boundaries that we would naturally make between humans and objects are not there. These, these don't just constitute the ancestors. They, they don't just represent the ancestors. They actually constitute them. So we need to think about in some ways our idea of caring for these things. Well, in some cases, these are not simply objects. They are objects that are about an ongoing ancestral presence. Maybe we need to sort of treat them as if they're human remains. Um, 
we we of course again in terms of if you return an item of a property that someone else owns if they're the descendants or the survivors uh in the case of of holocaust loot the argument always was well what if we lose these paintings these artworks you know from sort of public display you know people can't see them they're hidden away in a private house or they're sold on the open market but in fact the argument was won in those cases well, yes, yeah, there is their object. They can do what they want with it. It's, it's, you know, we don't regulate the art market in that way. So surely the same argument would hold for African colleagues. More importantly, though, in the very specific case of African um, sort of returns, in the case of the Benin Bronzes, you know, Sir David Ajay is uh, building a new museum with with immense funding from 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 the governor of Edo State and from other investors. If you go to Benin City, if you go to Lagos, you know, there are Benin bronzes, which have been perfectly safe for years. They're there in the museums. Uh, they're not. We could we, we could argue that they're not. Uh, the museums aren't all that well resourced. But then how well resourced are our museums when we, we can't even tell how many objects are in the British Museum from the Benin expedition? So much of this is what's about hidden away in our collections. Even for the British Museum, they estimate that about 100 of their 950 plus objects simply from, 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 you know, from the Benin 1897 attack are on display. So 850 of the, of the 950 are hidden away in the stores. We haven't got e even a public list of what they are. So it becomes very difficult then to say that we're caring for them very well. So many of those myths that were generated, I mean, there's a very interesting book by, by my colleague, uh, Benedict Savoir, which was out in German earlier this year. It's called Afrika's Kampf um seine Kunst, Africa's Struggle for Its Art. It'll be out in English early next year. She makes the devastating point that in the years that followed the so-called uh, Year of Africa in 1960, a year in which 18 or 19 African nations sort of gained independence in the same year, there were sort of politicians, at the time it was a Tory administration here, here in the UK, but they got together with their sort of colleagues in France, Germany, other European nations, alongside civil servants and also museum directors to concoct a series of laws that prevented returns from national museums, but also a set of myths. So those myths that were created related to the idea, well, if you return it, it will be sold off. If you return it, there'll be a war and it, it will all be destroyed. If you return it to Africa, then it won't be looked after properly. In reality, each of those things that supposedly might happen if you return the Brennan Bronzes, my book shows, really did happen to Benin bronzes here in the UK. So in the Blitz, Hull Museum and Liverpool Museum were bombed. You can go and look in the storerooms there and there are Benin bronzes that were just, that were partially destroyed. There were sort of melted fragments of them from attacks here in the UK. In terms of selling off the collections, maybe the single most important collection of the Benin bronzes, the second Pitt Rivers collection that Augustus Pitt Rivers held on his own estate on the Wiltshire Dorset border, was sold off on the open market piecemeal between the 1960s and, and, and also the 1980s. And then in terms of how well we look after them, the curatorial standards, you've only got to look at the leaky roof in the in the galleries of the Devine uh, galleries of the British Museum that mean that they haven't even opened the path and the marbles on display for, for over a year. Um, and the fact that we don't know how many of the Benin bronzes we've got to say, well, actually this is double standards there as well. So uh, obviously there's a lot there, that was a long answer, sorry, but hopefully that answers <laughs> some, of, some of these issues. Yeah. Thank you, Thank I you thoroughly can. enjoyed. The long Thank answer, you. wasn't it? Um, um, Lyndon. A most interesting uh, uh, lecture and very topical because there's been quite a bit in the news and on various programmes on TV. Oh, tonight left. And um, the uh, interest, one of the things you mentioned towards the end was the, um, the, the Second World War and the First World War and uh, the history of it being taught and uh, in schools, etc. But in fact, for many people, the history that is taught in the UK schools is very much uh, 
uh, uh, uh, not a true representation of what actually went on. And of course, when you look back in, say, to some of the countries like Africa and India, uh, which the British occupied over many years, there was great exploitation. And of course, one never know, or never one talks about how great the empire was, but one never knows or not really told about how badly the local people living in those countries had been treated. And so history at one level is quite an important thing. But it, what we really need is history that does reflect what actually went on, not just on the British side, but which also in, in, uh, affected and uh, drastically the lives of those people living in the country. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the, I mean, the British were famous for burning the documents at the end of empire, you know, but they didn't burn the artifacts. They didn't burn down the museums. So we find ourselves oddly, I find myself here in the Pitt Rivers in this space um, with these objects that in some way, part of their value for us as a nation, is there a unique index of those histories, of those? I mean, we've got so many of these expeditions that nobody's heard of, but were so important, are represented here in artworks and in culture. So I think there's this really interesting moment across the continent of Europe now. I mean, you may have read in the press about Emmanuel Macron in France returning some of the artefacts to Senegal, to Benin, to Mad yeah, Madagascar. The Germans have said they'll go, they'll they'll happily return all their Benin bronzes. So the the reckoning with the British colonial past is being led from Berlin, not from London at the moment. Uh, we've got the Dutch uh, and the Swiss have announced national commissions of inquiry, you know, into colonialism. You've got the Belgians facing up to the Belgian Congo and all of the horror that went on there. Even in the devolved regions in the UK, I mean, I think the conversations in Cardiff about removing a statue from the Welsh Assembly, the conversations in Edinburgh about just being open to, well, yeah, if someone wants to you know, rename a road because it's named after somebody that, that offends people and, and is celebrating a history that maybe we want to understand the history, but we don't want, want to celebrate it. We want to think about it and tell the history in different ways. And obviously in Northern Ireland, you know, a very, very, and indeed across the island of Ireland, a very different reckoning with the colonial past is happening. I, I mean, I've in writing the book, I, I didn't put this in the book, but, you know, I was very aware that the framing of the expedition against Benin as a punitive expedition, because in theory, five men were killed in an attempt to access the Oba and therefore the whole massive military force of 5,000 men was a reprisal. It reminds you of the role of the idea of uh, reprisals and all that brought in the south of Ireland in the early 20th century, in Kenya in, in the 1950s. Um, so it's a reckoning that's happening across Europe. And I also think for those of us with sort of rather longer memories, we might say, you know, that the best part, that the, the, the one of the most long lasting, you know, elements of the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s was that that movement said absolutely clearly racism is not something that is simply natural or universal, a human uh, tendency. It's something that has a history. And in the 60s and 70s, Actually, the civil rights movement was so important to underlining the history of enslavement, the transatlantic slave trade, the history of the of the grabbing of land from indigenous people. Now, in the 2020s, there's another in this sort of, in this next phase of the civil rights movement, you know, which we're calling the Black Lives Matter movement, but it but it's an ongoing process. Actually, there's another historical reckoning that's happening. We've closed our eyes to what happened after abolition and emancipation. We, you know, we, you know for the 2007 sort of 200 year anniversary of, of abolition, it almost became a celebration under the Gordon Brown administration at the end of the Blair government, where so the Gordon Brown was all about sort of Britishness, about sort of celebrating the British Isles. 
it became a celebration. We we won emancipation and, and abolition. It was a success for the British. So in, in the process, we have shut our eyes. We've got this big Queen Victoria sized black hole in our historical consciousness from 1837 to eight, from abolition and when she came to the throne, right the way up, I'd say until the Second World War. So what the book talks about is about World War Zero, as I call it. Um, that's about recognizing that in every year, you know, think about the 19th century. What do we think about the British on the international stage? Maybe we think about the Crimean War, but almost certainly we think about the abolition and emancipation of the slave trade. Then we jump ahead to World War One. In every year of the Victor of the reign of Queen Victoria, there were wars. There were big wars in Asia, in Africa. Every year, this ongoing military, corporate military process happened. We're just waking up to that historical consciousness of what that violence meant, but also what it meant at home, how we started telling stories to ourselves that this was OK because we were somehow superior. And I think that's what's so interesting happening now across the country and across Europe. We're having a reckoning with that historical phase which is uncomfortably close i mean and so my friend mark walker who lives in Ang in anglesey uh he is seeking he's the grandson of herbert walker who served as an officer in the benin expedition he's trying to return objects that he inherited from his grandfather that's how near this is it's two generations you know away he's a retired uh, medical yeah, medical consultant He's thinking about where those objects go next and he wants them actually to be returned to Nigeria. So, so that's how near this is in time. And it's just so interesting. I mean, I certainly, I mean, when I, in the 1970s and 80s, when I was being taught history, you know, I was taught this time frame, but completely from the frame of the Franco-Prussian War and, you know, Franz Ferdinand being shot and so on, and not a, not a mention of all this wider history. So there's a new generation that are coming up in their twenty, who are now in their twenties and thirties, who I think are, rec are they're coming to terms with this history, and you know it can only be a good thing. Yeah. And our museums are really crucial spaces for having these conversations. That's what's so so exciting for me, you know, in this sort of these sort of legacy institutions of the anthropology museum that we often feel are maybe irrelevant or out of time. Actually, they're being reinvented by people, by African artists who want to exhibit their work you know and by people who want to see the spaces in part as a sort of size of conscience a size of memory a way these are these are partly battlefields war zones you know we can come to terms the tone is changing and that bernie grant anger that was maybe important in 97 is giving way you know to conversations about social justice about reconciliation about hope and and about rebuilding after you know, after conflict, yeah. Thank you, Dan. Any more questions? No more? It's an awful lot to think about. <laughs> it's an awful lot to take on board. Um, if I can hand you over to Andrew. Sorry. Can you hear me now? That's better. Uh, can I hand you over to Andrew? Thank you very much, uh, Carmen. Um, there's, a, there's a lot. There's a lot to say by way of thanks, and I think I need to start by thanking you, Carmen, <laughs> uh, for your cl clairvoyance, uh, because it's quite a while ago now since you had the idea of inviting uh, Dan, and uh, quite a few months ago. And uh, who was to know uh, that um, now uh, what uh, Dan's been talking about is being talked about all over the world? Um, Strangely enough, I was at a, um, uh, a talk last night by David Anderson, uh, who is uh, oh, wonderful. Yeah, great friend. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Director General of the of Amgeda Cymru. Uh, he was talking about what what a what a museum's all about, and he was talking, of course, about the Benin bronzes, uh, in part. And it's difficult to come to any other conclusion that um, some tipping point has been reached. And um, what was perhaps a, a, a rough interest in things like uh, the Benin Bronzes and restitution uh, is now really um, a, a core part of public discussion 
in, in the country. Uh, so I think, Dan, you are in part uh, to blame for uh, this, this <laughs> fact that we're now all talking about uh, museum restitution. Uh, I've just been reading a book, um, you may have seen two television programs <coughs> by him, a book by Sathnam Sanghera uh, called Empire Land, which came out earlier this year, uh, which has a section called <laughs> And that too also deals with the uh, Can I just ask Andrew for everybody, can you please check your muting? Because we can't, we can't hear. That's great, thank you. Sorry, Andrew. Um, I'll continue. Uh, we need to thank um, uh, Dan for several things. First of all, uh, for introducing or reintroducing us to the Pitt Rivers Museum. Uh, for my money, uh, one of the most fascinating museums in the whole world. Uh, and um, not only for its collections, but also for the wonderful work that you've done, Dan, with you and your colleagues on reframing and reinterpreting the collections and the whole idea behind the museum for a new, a new generation. It's, if you haven't been there, I would thoroughly recommend it. Um, it's, it gives you a, a wonderful idea of time travel as well. Uh, you can go straight back uh, to the time of Pitt Rivers just go, by going through the door. Um, we need to thank you too for introducing us to some of Pitt Rivers' ideas about the typology of uh, objects and particularly weapons uh, and uh, how um, ground the whole collection was in empire and military, um, military victory, military violence. Uh, your quotation, one of the most violent spaces in Oxford, uh, is maybe a surprise, but maybe not so much of a surprise, I don't know. Thank you as well for introducing us to uh, Benin. And um, I think we could have had a whole other lecture about Benin with uh, um, where you might have shown at your illustrations slightly less quickly. Um, but it was great uh, to be uh, told about uh, Benin again. In your list, I was really rather um, pleased to see, see there were no Welsh institutions apparently holding Benin bronzes. Um, for my money in the British Museum, uh, those collections of Benin bronzes are absolutely wonderful and I always go and see them if I go to the British Museum they're just wonderful but they shouldn't be there and uh, so we ought to thank you too uh, for talking about restitution. Uh, I remember 20 years ago I sat on a body called the National Museum Directors Conference and uh, that was much uh, exercised at the, t at the time uh, by uh, Nazi loot and the need uh, to give back from museums uh, which had gathered Nazi loot, um, some of the art, artworks and so on, back to their, their original owners. Uh, and I could see at the time that that was not going to stay with Nazi loot, that it was going uh, eventually to uh, lead to discussion, serious discussion about all kinds of other loot, which um, was in uh, European museums, British museums. Um, and then finally, um, I think we need to thank you uh, for um, the way that you talk to us, because I've, I, I've been in a, in a talk recently, which has quite fizzed quite as much as uh, your talk has. Uh, you fizzed with ideas and images, and um, uh, we could have gone on for another couple of hours, I think, quite happily, and maybe we should invite you back. Uh, but it's been a, a wonderful experience uh, just listening to you talking and responding to questions. Uh, so thank you very much, Dan, for a really wonderful evening. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and yes, Dan, yes, it was wonderful. Um, keeps on going. It's a shame we couldn't all have met in person, um, but, um, but I, I really do appreciate you giving time this evening to give us an absolutely outstanding uh, lecture. So can we unmute and um, show our appreciation, show our appreciation of, of Dan's lecture. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And I think uh, your yeah, final thing to, the final thing to say from me in some ways is that, you know, I really, the, uh, the, uh, the highlight for me of all of the talks I give, and I've, I've given talks to, um, in some cases, more than a thousand people on some calls in some of the United States ones. We had more than 6,000 on the MC Hammer event. But for me, actually, it's institutions like your own 
how these conversations are happening at the grassroots, how they're happening locally, how these ongoing 19th century institutions that are so important for sort of regional culture, intellectual culture, regionally, they're, they're, they're so important, you know, you to keep them going. And I know how hard it is sometimes, especially under lockdowns and under with everything COVID has brought, it's incredibly hard to keep such organisations uh, sort of coherent. So I mean, well done for all of the work that you do. Keep up the good work of uh, keeping your institution uh,